Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome. My name is Scott Christian. I'm here to welcome you to 2019 Atlanta B Size. This is our fifth track presentation on the policy track. Uh, we have Amber Welch, who is from the Shellman Company. She's going to be talking to us about privacy and what you can do uh, to protect your business. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, for those of you in the back, please let me know if you can't hear me. Um, I also usually give this talk at a 45 minute slot, but we're here for 25 minutes, so I'm going to talk very fast, and questions will be out there. <laughs> So I evaluate corporate privacy policies and privacy programs for a living. I am an auditor or privacy program assessor. I have worked with um, Silicon Valley big tech names, small startups, um, IoT firms, um, your large enterprise old school firms. So I've seen quite a few things, um, some of them very scary, which will show up in the talk. So today we're going to talk about data subject access requests, um, the DSRs, which is what uh, some people call them, the exploits that you're able to do with them, and some defense strategies for those of you who are working in a company that may have to honor some of these requests. So we'll start with the data subject requests. Is anybody familiar with this concept already? Handful? Okay. So this is something that um, has come out mostly from GDPR, that's where Americans got their first taste of it. So we're living in a global privacy era now. Um, data is transferred between um, nations, a lot of companies have branches internationally, are processing international data, and are responsible for um, maintaining privacy law compliance across borders. So it's very different from what we're used to, and these access laws, even though they're slightly different between nations, most countries that do have some kind of privacy law will have something to do with access rights. So we're going to talk mostly about GDPR just because it's a good case study, but this, these concepts are applicable no matter where you are, Canada, California, Brazil, um, APEC region. So there are four primary exploitable rights. The first one is the access right. This is the major, the major issue for um, exploit concepts. So the, the right to access is just the right to tell a company, hey, I know you have data on me, I want to know what you have, give me a full record of everything that you've got. The other thing you can do is request modification. So you can tell a company, the data you have on me is incorrect, and I'm going to tell you to change it. Uh, this is also known as the right to rectification sometimes. So you might see those. It's a good way to get a foot in the door with some of the exploits without asking for the full data set. You can also request erasure. This is commonly known as the right to be forgotten under GDPR. Uh, not every access law has this, but it does show up some places. And there's also the right to portability, where you can request a machine-readable export of your information to port it over to a competitor, which obviously would give you all of that data as well. So there are a few new challenges that have shown up with these access laws. We have in the California Privacy Law, um, the CCPA, there's a concept of metadata and indirect identifiers. They have added household data and device data to the concept of uh, what constitutes PII, or personal information. GDPR also added things like IP addresses. This has not traditionally been an American concept of personal data. So if you're thinking about protecting personal information, the scope is very broad now. Um, also, both GDPR and CCPA have decided that if the data can potentially be linked to a person, even if it's not currently identifiable, that's also personal data. Uh, this has a lot of implications for machine learning that we can't get into today, but uh, maybe next year I'll do a talk on that, so hopefully I'll see you then. Um, the other issue that we've seen, um, mostly from the EU concept of control, data controllers and data processors, is that if you have personal information, even if you didn't mean to collect it, you're still responsible for fulfilling these um, privacy access rights. There's a really interesting case where this guy sued Google Spain for the right to be forgotten under the previous the data protection directive. It's like GDPR predecessor. And Google argued, we didn't intend to collect this information. It's just the internet. I mean, what are we supposed to do about the internet? It's just, it is what it is. Um, but the EU decided that you, as the data controller, Google, are still responsible for honoring his request to be forgotten even if you really had nothing to do with gathering that information and the information is not associated with any particular account. So now that um, 
now that American companies have so much obligation to abide by European law, these are new concepts that a lot of U.S. organizations will have to learn to accept. So this leaves us with the idea that potentially everything can be personal data. Um, it's very difficult to know for sure that something is not personal data if it could be linked to somebody, right? I mean, how do you define for sure that something isn't personally identifiable or couldn't become personally identifiable? So what have companies done about this? American companies went through a big panic mode if you all remember the onslaught of privacy policy update emails, the you know GDPR day, um, the day in which privacy lawyers got PTSD. So <laughs> most companies just panicked. Um, a lot of them made really bad decisions. Uh, there's a lot of fear. The 4% potential revenue um, fine by the EU was a big scare tactic. Um, a lot of privacy vendors really fed into this because they wanted the business. Um, and there's generally a lot of misunderstanding. So most organizations took the direction of just providing all of the information when they got one of these data subject requests. A lot of them also have chosen to outsource to legal firms, partly as a CYA move, right? Like, it's not our problem, somebody else told us to do it, we hired somebody. So um, <laughs> the problem with that is that legal firms are quite expensive. Um, and legal firms don't necessarily understand your technical environment and may not have a very good understanding of security concepts, especially regarding identification of data subjects. So in general, most companies fear non-compliance more than they fear a potential data breach of just one person's information. With data subject access requests, there are a couple of ways that you can honor these requests. You can give an automated way for data subjects to go into an account and submit this uh, completely without any human intervention other than setting up the process in the first place. Or on the other end, you can go completely manual, um, provide a, a form for someone to fill out their information, and you would manually process that request. Um, there's also a few hybrid approaches where you can uh, have people click a button in their account maybe and generate a few uh, pieces of information and then someone else in DBA somewhere will complete the request. Usually companies decide which one they're going to do based on the cost to implement an automated solution versus how much they expect to get um, or the complexity of the data. So what can you do with all of this information? The fun stuff, right? One of my favorite topics is legal DDoS. So, there used to be a clause in the Data Protection Directive um, where you could charge somebody, um, under, in the UK it was up to 10 pounds, uh, 12 euros, to submit these requests. So even though sometimes the requests are more expensive to process than that, it acted as a bit of a deterrent, so people weren't just able to do it for free. Under the GDPR you can't do that. You have to process for free up until you can decide for sure, and prove your um, position that this has become abusive. So there's quite a lot of back and forth that can happen between that lawyer that you hired as an outsourced firm and some data subject who has a problem with you before you can prove this is finally abusive. Um, that can get pretty expensive and it can rack up quite a bill for you. This is also very effective against large organizations that have a, an otherwise strong privacy program. There's not much that you can do about it. So a lot of people organize together could really cause a lot of trouble for even a very well-developed mature privacy program. This is also highly likely to happen after a data breach just naturally because people will say, I no longer trust this organization, I want to know what information you have and I want you to delete it. So if you are in the news for a breach, you should expect to have a lot of data subject requests following that and you need to be prepared to deal with that volume. So outsourcing DSRs to legal firms is super expensive. This guy asked a midwifery clinic in the UK for information about the death of his uh, infant son. The UK firm spent £240,000 on a legal firm to redact that information and, and honor the data subject request. So that £10 doesn't go very far in offsetting that, and now you don't even have the £10. So a fun example, Twitter believes that I'm a man. I think this is hilarious. So I figured we might as well ask the data protection officer at Twitter why they think that I'm a man. Um, I have the right to do that. I can ask for information about myself. So you probably can't read it, but they paid a lawyer to write this. It took them a couple of weeks. 
and they generated a response um, just because I felt like figuring out why. And I also have the opportunity to continue this conversation with them until I'm satisfied that the request has been completed. I don't really care that much, so um, I feel like we've served the purpose with that, but there's quite a long ways that you could go in continuing this dialogue where it's free on your end and potentially very expensive for them. There are a few other things that you can do with um, malicious activity on data subject requests. Uh, some privacy firms have been doing guerrilla marketing where they annoy a company into wanting to purchase a privacy solution, which seems like bad marketing to me, but I guess I'm not a salesperson. Um, also, you can do competitor research to learn about how they're processing data subject requests and just copy their solution instead of hiring a consultant to do it for you. Disgruntled employees can submit a lot of access requests just to pester the company or find out what information they have. And some lawyers, especially employment lawyers, have been using DSRs as a free e-discovery tool because they, some of the information that they might need is still there. Uh, you also see, unfortunately, some potential for domestic partner violence or um, intimate partner violence, stalking, and other abuse victims since a person who is in an intimate relationship will have a lot of information on someone and can get things like all of their messaging data, location data, a lot of really um, private information. There's also a lot of potential for phishing here. Um, you can use common names. Uh, Google used to just accept a passport as proof of identity. But when you think about it, what is a name really? Um, there are a lot of people with my name. I get their email address uh, mixed up with mine all the time, so I have information coming into my Gmail account. DSRs work in much the same way. If a company doesn't have a good identity solution, they're just going to believe somebody who has some kind of scan of a document. But really all that tells you is that they know somebody who has that name or may have that name themselves, or were able to find a picture of it, or even Photoshop it. Um, you can also ask for updates. Um, you can ask for the privacy officer. There's a lot of information you can get about the privacy program itself uh, while you're in this dialogue. They have to process verbal requests. So from a phishing standpoint, that's great, because you're probably going to be on the phone with a tier one support person, and we all know how easy it is to get information from them. They're really helpful. They really want to see you succeed. So they might um, give a lot of information about the record that they're looking at. You can potentially match up um, to records that you have that you want to confirm with the same person. You can fill in gaps that you have on a record if you're doing spear phishing or CEO fraud. So the takeaway here is to remember that the name is not really very important. The name of the data subject doesn't tell you much about whether that record is actually that person. So what you can do with the phishing, you can confirm the profile data, um, and, and this is uh, an area where you can learn new information really easily because um, you can guess at information, and if you're correct, then you've confirmed it. If you want to, to do some of this as an activity, or you're maybe a pen tester, and you want to see if this is an area where a target is weak, um, you can evaluate a privacy policy with um, a tool called Privot.org. It will uh, intake a privacy policy and parse it into um, this alluvial diagram. So a weak one, you'll see, just kind of flows into unspecified choice, which means they probably don't have many policies in place about how to deal with DSRs because they haven't thought very much about their privacy policy. So a really developed privacy policy will have a lot of that uh, spaghetti going on. So weak targets tend to be organizations that have a lot of indirect identifiers and metadata, but not accounts associated with that metadata. Um, international charities, because they are obligated to abide by a lot of privacy laws and probably don't have much budget to do that. Um, social media startups tend to be a little loose about their privacy anyway, um, and usually haven't hired a compliance person yet. Uh, also, anything that is in the minimally regulated space like hospitality, and also any apps without 2FA. So this I found on Twitter, which was really interesting. Somebody found that her Spotify information had been downloaded because Spotify has an automated DSR form and somebody was able to access her account because there is no 2FA. 
So I thought, well, let's go back to Twitter, see what this process actually looks like. All you do is you go in, there, it doesn't prompt for a secondary 2FA, so if you're already authenticated to a session, somebody could do this if they just had your password. You have to enter your password again, but no 2FA. You click the button for request data, it goes into retrieving data, and about an hour later, I get an email saying that I can download the data now. So I go in and click the button. This is everything that I get. It is all of the data associated with the Twitter account, which Twitter has been around for a very long time, so that's potentially a decade of somebody's private messages, history, um, social contacts, location data. So what's concerning about this is that subject access rights have been a potential issue for over 40 years now. Um, this has been known in Europe, it's maybe new to, to America, but this is not a new concept, and there's been a black market for this data for a very long time. And yet security as a whole has no idea about this. I very rarely run into someone who's even thought about this being a potential issue. Mostly because it's the domain of lawyers, and security professionals are very rarely asked for their opinion about this. So, as the security professionals, I'm now enlisting your help in this, please care, as a person with a common name, uh, what can you do about it? So, the usual DSR process of those types, um, if you have any kind of human interaction at all, you get a generic email inbox where the information comes in, the request comes in, and it's parsed out into high risk or low risk. Uh, support staff usually do low risk. Um, even potentially down to password resets if somebody just got confused and lost in the system. And then the high risk of that goes to a lawyer or maybe the privacy office, which is a fancy name for another lawyer. So the manual processing then, if that request is approved, is sent to somebody like a DBA or someone responsible for running a script against the database. The security team is almost never involved in this, as far as I've seen. And usually, even if there is a policy that says you need to identify somebody, there's not much information about how to do it. There are very rarely um, rules about what is what constitutes sufficient identification for that data subject. So the identity challenge is very complicated with this, especially because of that uh, requirement to fulfill a DSR even where you don't have an account. California specifically says, you cannot require somebody to have an account in order to fulfill a DSR. So you've got a lot of issues. You can't link the data with one person potentially. You might not have a name, you might not have an account. Uh, but at the same time, you can't just reject it because it's difficult. You can't ask them for excessive information. If you do take in identity documents, um, they still might not tell you who that person is. And now you've just collected even more sensitive information. So, key takeaway here, remember, you don't need identity documents. The only time that you would ever need a scan of somebody's ID is if you already had that information in the first place. If you have a driver's license number that you know is associated with an account, then fine, go ahead and ask for a scan. That's, that makes sense. But if you don't, then why are you asking for that? It doesn't tell you anything at all. The other good method is that you, and basically the only sufficient method for most, um, most DSRs, is to confirm with a secret between that, that individual and the data that's on that record. So in the hotel idea, um, let's say after this, uh, you know, we, we hang out at a hotel bar and I sign with my room number on the card and it charges to the card on the room. Somebody else comes by and picks up that receipt, has my name and has my room number so they know the date of the last stay. So if that person makes a fraudulent DSR under my name, they would have one secret, right? The date of the last day. So it's not, when we think about secret information and transaction history, you have to make sure they're sufficiently different and you have multiple transactions that you're confirming so that it's not, you're not accidentally confirming against incidental data that's quite public. So another good option would be date of the last day plus last four digits on the card associated with the account. And you can have a list of acceptable options maybe uh, require more types if you um, if you have weak uh, ID options. Does anybody know what this is? The Arecibo message? Yeah, I have like three people that are really excited and everybody else is confused. Um, so the, this is the Arecibo radio telescope in Puerto Rico, which is super awesome. If you can ever go to Puerto Rico, I highly recommend it. James Bond likes it too. Um, the Arecibo message is, is meant to be a way to communicate between 
life forms that essentially have no other information about each other, no identity, not even any knowledge that the other one might exist. So when you're thinking about identification, try to step away from identifying an individual and focus instead on identifying data and confirming that data matches the same person that it, that it originated from. Just don't even worry about names unless you actually have some really good ID documents. So risk-based identification processes. You want to use graduated ID requirements, so if you have highly sensitive information, don't just give it away to somebody who is able to answer a couple of questions that are quite easy. At the same time, if you have low risk information, don't make somebody go through like, you know, the DNA scan just to get their, you know, couple of pieces of data about some, you know, app they signed up for. You have to assume that all ID numbers are compromised. So even if you have a number on the account, if you're using that as an ID, you need to get a scan still. But also make sure that you're not making them email that to you in an unsecured format. Uh, all, all documents should be provided in some kind of secure communication. All of this should happen either through a portal or um, some other way that can be secure. Uh, NIST also has digital identity guidelines, which can be helpful, especially if you're working in a, an organization that has a lot of sensitive information. This would give you really strong support that you did due diligence on this process. So ways that you can minimize risk, you can go with that automated self-service option. Um, but if you do that, make sure you have 2FA in place so that we can avoid you know, Spotify issues. Um, also, if you are doing a hybrid or manual kind of way of doing it, and there is an account, put in some kind of UI banner so that somebody who does access the account can see, oh, my account's compromised. Um, you know, Twitter told, sent me an email saying not to worry about it if my if I got this request, but that happened behind authentication, right? So that should be a really big flag. So make sure that users who have a potentially compromised account would know that this was being done. Uh, you also want to wait a little while if you're doing a request. There's no reason to send it back in an hour if you think that um, you know maybe a 24-hour waiting period would be more appropriate if you have a lot of data that you're delivering. Um, also, you don't need to export accessible data. There's no requirement for you to provide information to do any kind of data egress if that data subject can actually access that information already. You can just direct them to it in the application and then that's it. You've fulfilled your responsibility. So don't send it out of the organization until you actually have to do that. All right, that's a lot of information. So here's my cat. A couple more things. This, you can take a picture of this if you want. I'm not going to read through all of it. These are the red flags if you want to look for metrics or ways that you might identify a potential attack campaign or somebody who is trying to get information from your DSR process. All right. So the other thing to keep in mind is that you are perfectly within your rights to reject data subject requests. You do not have to fulfill every request. Your default should be Deny until it has been validated. Don't validate until you get some spidey sense that something might be wrong, because especially if lawyers are the ones doing this, that is basically never going to happen. Uh, they, don't, they don't tend to think that um, somebody might be fishing them. This is your second photo slide. These are all of the reasons that are supported by the laws that you can use to reject requests. Um, I also have the legal text in a cheat sheet that I will give you a GitHub link to for both uh, CCPA and GDPR as they stand right now. CCPA might change. Um, but make sure that you know enough about the law so that you have the ability to turn something down and you have a justification for it. So, ah, 324, I made it. <laughs> so we need security people. We need security people to know about these problems, to care about them. Um, it's your personal information too. There's very little that any individual can do about these kind of uh, weaknesses. So all we can do is make sure that companies are aware of this issue, um, implementing good processes, and please make friends with your lawyers. Um, I, they don't bite, I promise. Just gently educate them that this could be a potential issue. So if you want the cheat sheet, there it is on GitHub. Um, I'm also on Twitter, so if you want to talk about this, um, feel free to. I love privacy, I love hearing weird use cases, so feel free to connect with me.